Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Cutrate Commander, the series where we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at the proud bearer of the Sisse bloodline, Shana Purifying Blade. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see who won last week's poll and what commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Shauna Purifying Blade is a 3-3 human warrior with lifelink that costs a green, a white, and a blue and has the following ability. At the beginning of our end step, we may pay X. If we do, draw X cards. X can't be greater than the amount of life we gained that turn. Taking a look at her core stats, Shauna possesses a mid-size CMC, a typical stat block for her cost along with built-in lifelink to pad our life totals in combat, and an ability that turns all our life gain into card advantage provided we have the mana to pump into it. Immediately, this ability is reminiscent of Well of Lost Dreams, with the caveat that it only procs on our end phase and adds up all the life we've gained throughout our entire turn when calculating how much we can pay for X. And just like Well of Lost Dreams, it provides an excellent form of continual card advantage for any life gain planned, and this one is one we'll always have access to from our command zone. And while yes, we do have to keep mana open until our end phase to pump into this ability to get that draw, Bant has no shortage of excellent ramp to get us the mana we need, as well as completely free passive forms of life gain as we summon creatures, draw cards, or even play lands, ensuring that we have a high life gain pool at the end of the turn and the mana to pump into it. So, as we can see, Shauna is clearly a life gain focused commander, aiming to have us accumulate life during our turn that she can then turn into card advantage for us. So, of course, we'll be taking her in a life gain focused direction, aiming to take full advantage of all three colors at our disposal to generate as much life and then as much value from that life as possible. Of course, that means we'll be running the best passive life gain that our colors have to offer, ensuring that almost every action we take, from drawing our cards or generating card advantage, making our land drops per turn and ramping, and casting our creature spells and creating tokens all generate life for us, ensuring that by the end of the turn, Shauna has a hefty pool of accumulated life to fuel her draw. And to go along with all this life gain, we'll of course have plenty of life gain payoffs to get us even more value as our life totals tick up, ranging from creating evasive or trampling tokens to increase our board state, or loading up our creatures with plus one plus one counters to grow them into legitimate threats. And lastly, we'll be including a handful of payoffs for all the draw that Shauna will be providing us with, ensuring that even the cards she draws for us generate value in the form of additional token creation and counter distribution. Now, let's see what the former captain of the Weatherlight can do. And while her ship may be gone, its legacy still remains. The wills of all those brave captains of the past now intertwined with her own. Sisse, Gerard, and Joyra, it's up to her now to ensure that their sacrifices were not in vain. So she will stand alongside the coalition against this new Phyrexian threat, and she will fight to her last breath and beyond to banish the evil legacy of Yogmoth once and for all. So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Starting off in the CMC1 slot, we have the Soul Sisters, Essence Warden, Soul Warden, and Soul's Attendant, all being 1-1s one that gain us one life whenever another creature ETBs, making them all dirt cheap sources of continual life gain that not only proc on our turns but on our opponent's turns as well, which is relevant for some of our payoffs that check for life gain on each turn instead of just our own. We then continue on the life gain plan with our next two entrants, Lunark Veteran and Jody Offshoot. Lunark Veteran is another 1-1 one -one that this time gains us one life whenever another creature ETBs under our control, and we can disturb from our graveyard for one in a white as Luminous Phantom, a 1-1 one -one flyer that, whenever another creature we control leaves the battlefield, gains us one life, not providing us with as much life gain as the Soul Sisters, but still being a solid addition that takes advantage of our large creature base and token creation. Jotty Offshoot is a 0-3 defender that, whenever a land ETB is under our control, gains us one life, making it the first of many effects that turn our land drops and land based ramp into additional life gain which, like the other entrants in this slot, hit the board early to begin gaining us life as soon as possible. Speaker of the Heavens then joins us as our first life gain payoff, being a 1-1 with Vigilance and Lifelink that we can tap at sorcery speed to create a 4-4 Flying Angel token, which we can only activate if we have 7 more life than our starting life total. Its ability to create angels coming online quickly in this build to help us grow our board states with evasive bodies, and its built-in Vigilance and Lifelink coming in handy if we're able to load it up with counters. 
We then close out this lot with Avison's Pilgrim and Caustic Caterpillar. Avison's Pilgrim is a 1-1 we can tap for a white, making it a simple but effective mana dork to help speed up our mana base that procs our creature based life gain sources as it comes in. Caustic Caterpillar is another 1-1 that we can pay 1, a green and sack to destroy target artifact or enchantment, providing us with some solid back row removal that again procs all our creature based ETB life gain sources as it comes in, making it more valuable in this build than non creature based removal alternatives. Moving on to the CMC2 slot, we'll continue on the removal on bodies game plan with Cathar Commando and Quasali Pride Mage, both of which we can pay 1 in sack to destroy target artifact or enchantment, the former being a 3-1 with flash and the latter being a 2-2 with exalted, again giving our build more removal on bodies to proc our life gain, and whose flash and exalted can be situationally useful to allow for surprise blocks or to empower our commander as they swing in. It's then back onto the life gain game plan with Daxos Blessed by the Sun, Suture Priest, Prosperous Innkeeper, and Impassioned Orator. The first being a 2 star whose toughness is equal to our devotion to white and also gains us 1 life whenever another creature we control dies. The second being a 1 1 that also has an opponent lose 1 life whenever a creature ETBs under their control. The third being another 1 1 that also creates a treasure token when it ETBs. And the last being a 2 2 with no other abilities. All providing us with even more sources of passive life gain to trigger Shana and our other life gain payoffs more reliably. Then it's on to even more life gaining creatures as we move deeper into this slot with Gala Greeters, Kazandu Nectar Pot, and Scavenging Ooze. Gala Greeters is a 1 1 that, whenever another creature ETBs under our control, lets us choose one of the following effects that hasn't been chosen yet that turn put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature, create a tapped treasure token, or gain 2 life. It's life gain being limited to once per turn, but being slightly bigger to compensate, which matters for certain payoffs that care about the amount being healed in one shot, while its other modes are solid ways to provide us with additional ramp and grow it over time as we create our tokens or summon our creatures. Kazandu Nectar Pot is a 1-3 that, whenever a land ETBs under our control, gains us one life, making it yet another way to turn our land drops and land based ramp into additional life gain for us. Scavenging Ooze is a 2-2 that lets us pay a green to exile target card from any graveyard, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on itself and gaining us 1 life if the exiled card was a creature, providing us with cheap and repeatable graveyard hates to counter graveyard focused builds that still sticks to our life gain focused game plan. We then switch gears from life gaining creatures to life gaining payoffs, with our next entrance being Voice of the Blessed and Trelasara Moon Dancer. Voice of the Blessed is a 2-2 that, whenever we gain life, puts a plus 1 plus 1 counter on itself, gaining flying and vigilance when it has 4 plus counters and becoming indestructible once it accumulates 10 plus, quickly turning into an out of control evasive threat that, if our opponents don't remove quickly, becomes very hard for them to interact with later. Trilasara is another 2-2 that also gains a plus 1 plus 1 counter whenever we gain life, in addition to also letting us scry 1, providing our build with a substantial amount of card selection as we gain life to help us dig deeper into our deck for more life gain sources or payoffs. And finally, we close out this slot with Sakura Tribe Elder, a 1-1 we can sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, making it a staple source of land base ramp that works particularly well in our build to gain us life as it comes down, and then again as the land it fetches comes into play. Proceeding to the CMC3 slot, we start off with a green life gain sources, Courser of Crufix, Grazing Gladeheart, and Social Climber. Courser of Crufix is a 2-4 that lets us play with a top card of our deck revealed, lets us play lands off the top of our deck, and gains us one life whenever a land ETBs under our control, again providing us with even more land based life gain while also making it easier to make our land drops off the top of our deck thanks to its land themed future sight. Grazing Gladeheart is a 2-2 that, whenever a land ETBs under our control, gains us 2 life, gaining us the biggest amount of life gain back per land drop yet to help keep adding our life totals, which also works well with our payoffs that care about life gain quality over quantity. Social Climber is a 2-3 that, whenever another creature ETBs under our control, gains us 1 life, being yet another passive source of creature based life gain that takes advantage of our large creature base and token creation in order to keep our life totals nice and high while easily proccing our payoffs. We then have the legendary entrant Silvala Explorer returned to joining our ranks, being a 2-4 that we can tap to have each player reveal a top card of their deck, producing a green mana and gaining us 1 life for each non-land card revealed, then having each player draw a card. The fact that she can generate up to 4 mana and 4 life for us on our turn working very well with our commander to both help us build our life gain per turn, as well as help cast our spells so we can save our other mana to pump into Shana's ability, making her well worth running despite the draw being symmetrical. 
Then we close out this slot with Knight of Autumn, a 2-1 that, when it ETBs, has us choose one of the following effects. Put two plus one plus one counters on it, destroy target artifact or enchantment, or gain four life. All its modes being useful depending on the situation, whether we need a decent sized body to grow our board, back row removal to deal with threats, or a burst of life gain to help proc our payoffs. The CMC4 slot is then up next, with another round of life gain sources joining our ranks in the form of Horizon Chimera and Tristani Selesnia's voice. Horizon Chimera is a 2-3 with Flash, Flying, and Trample that, whenever we draw a card, gains us one life, now providing our build with the means to turn our draw into life gain, and whose decent evasive stat block makes it a good target for our payoffs that load creatures up with plus one plus one counters to allow it to get in for more damage. Tristani is a 2-5 who, whenever another creature ETBs under our control, gains us life equal to its toughness, and lets us pay one, a white, a green, and tapper to populate, gaining us decent chunks of life as our bigger creatures and tokens enter play, while also allowing us to double up on our biggest tokens with her populate effect, both proccing herself and our other creature base sources of life gain as she does so. We then swap back to life gain payoffs as we wrap up this slot with Accomplished Alchemist, Twinblade Paladin, and Lothiel the Bountainous Dawn. Accomplished Alchemist is a 2-5 we can either tap for a man of any color, or instead tap for X man of any one color, where X is equal to the amount of life we gained that turn, making it a decent source of ramp that works very well alongside our commander, allowing us to pump the maximum amount of mana into her ability every turn. Twinblade Paladin is a 3-3 that, whenever we gain life, puts a plus one plus one counter on itself in addition to gaining double strike so long as our life totals are over 25, making it yet another threat that grows alongside our life totals whose double strike condition is very easy to meet considering we start at 40 life. Lothiel is a 2-2 with lifelink that, at the beginning of each end step if we gained life that turn, lets us distribute plus one plus one counters to any other creatures up to the amount of life we gained, providing our build with a reliable way to grow our creatures, with the added benefit of also proccing on our opponent's turns to take full advantage of our life gain sources no matter when they trigger. Now entering the CMC5 slot, the first half brings us the legends Shabraz the Sky Shark and Tatiova Benthic Druid. Shabraz is a 3-3 flyer that, whenever we draw a card, puts a plus one plus one counter on himself and gains us one life, in addition to letting us pay either a blue or a white to give target human flying until end of turn, working very well alongside Shauna to grow himself rapidly with her ability, gaining us large chunks of life as he does so, as well as having an easy means to make Shauna evasive to more easily allow her to get in for damage. Tatiova is another 3-3 that, whenever a land ETBs under our control, draws us a card and gains us one life, making her the highest CMC source of land-based life gain in our arsenal, but more than making up for it by also tacking on repeatable card advantage to it, netting us even more value as we make our land drops and ramp. The latter half of this slot then brings us the life gain payoffs, Blossoming Bog Beast, and Crested Sun Mare. Blossoming Bog Beast is a 3-3 that, whenever it attacks, gains us 2 life and then gives all our creatures plus X plus X and trample until end of turn, where X is equal to the amount of life we gained that turn, providing our entire board with an overrun style effect that scales with our life gain, pumping all our creatures stats to enormous numbers to enable devastating alpha strikes. Breasted Sun Mare is a 5-5 that makes all other horses we control indestructible and, on each end step if we gain the life that turn, creates a 5-5 horse creature token, making it a fantastic life gain payoff that generates up to 20-20 worth of stats per rotation and even protects the tokens it creates until it's dealt with. Closing in on the end now, the CMC6 slot brings us even more life gain payoffs with Nykthos Paragon and Valkyrie Harbinger. Nykthos Paragon is a 4-6 that, whenever we gain life, puts that many counters on each creature we control, limited to once each turn, potentially empowering our board on every player's turn depending on what life gain sources we have in play, quickly turning even the smallest life gainer into a massive beat stick. Valkyrie Harbinger is a 4-5 flyer that, at the beginning of each end step if we gain 4 plus life that turn, creates a 4-4 angel token with flying and vigilance, its token creation requirement being very easily met on our turns while still being reasonably met on our our opponents, allowing it to flood the skies with evasive bodies that are both good on offense and defense. And finally, reaching the CMC7 slot and our last creature, we have Drog Skull Reaver, a 3-5 flyer with double strike and lifelink that, whenever we gain life, draws us a card. Its life gain based card draw working very well to keep our hands nice and full as we pad our life totals, and its decent stat block and myriad of keywords making it a solid creature to grow with counters. Though it should be noted, if we play it alongside either Shabraz the Sky Shark or Horizon Chimera, we'll instantly draw through our entire deck if we gain life or draw a card, so we need to be careful unless we want to mill ourselves. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. 
Starting in the CMC1 slot, we have its two entrants, Path to Exile and Swords to Plash Heirs, both of which exile target creature, the former letting its owner put a basic land from their deck into play tapped, and the latter letting its controller gain life equal to its power instead, making them both powerful exile-based removal that cheaply deals with otherwise problematic creatures. Then skipping to the CMC3 slot, we have our last pair of instants, Beast Within and Generous Gift, both of which destroy target permanent, giving its owner a 3-3 to replace it, this time providing us with removal options that can deal with a wide variety of threats, and whose token creation can even occasionally proc some of our life gain and life gain payoffs on our opponent's turns. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. Skipping right to the CMC2 slot, we start off with the Ramp Sources, Rampant Growth, Far Seek, and Nature's Lore, all of which let us search our deck for a land and put it into play, the first being limited to basics and putting it into play tapped, the second being limited to a land with a non-forest basic land type and also putting it into play tapped, and the last fetching up any forest, providing the build with staple land-based ramp to help speed up and fix our colors, while also proccing our land-based life gain sources. The CMC3 slot then brings us even more ramp sources with Cultivate and Kodama's Reach, both of which let us search our deck for two basic lands, putting one into play tapped and the other into our hand, giving the build even more land-based ramp and ensuring we have the land in hand to make future land drops as well. Then skipping to the CMC5 slot, we have its single entrant, Fumigate, which destroys all creatures and gains us one life for each creature destroyed, simultaneously wiping the board and gaining us an enormous amount of life back, which we can then use in conjunction with our non-creature life gain payoffs to begin rebuilding our board after the dust settles. We then have another wipe being added to our arsenal as we move into the CMC6 slot, that being Austere Command, which has us choose two of the following effects. Destroy all artifacts, destroy all enchantments, destroy all creatures of CMC3 or less, and or destroy all creatures of CMC4 or greater, making it a very customizable wipe that we can cater to our needs as we cast it to maximize the damage it does to our opponents while minimizing the damage it does to us. And finally, reaching the CMC7 slot in our last sorcery, we have Approach of the Second Sun, which the first time we cast it gains a 7 life and sends itself 7 cards deep into our deck, and the second time we cast it from our hand wins us the game, making it a potent alternate win con that, when combined with the draw Shana provides, we can easily get back to hand after its initial casting after a turn or two, or even on the same turn provided we have 14 mana open. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. Beginning in the CMC1 slot, we start off with a pair of classes in the form of Cleric Class and Wizard Class. Cleric Class at level 1 gains us an additional life whenever we gain a life. At level 2, which costs 3 and a white, lets us, whenever we gain life, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature. And at level 3, which costs 4 and a white, returns target creature from our graveyard back into play and gains us life equal to its toughness. Its first two levels synergizing perfectly with our game plan to amplify and weaponize our life gain, while its reanimation effect can be situationally useful to reanimate payoffs or life gain sources that may have been removed by our opponents. Wizard class at level 1 removes our maximum hand size limit, at level 2 which costs 2 and a blue draws us 2 cards, and at level 3 which costs 4 and a blue puts a plus 1 plus 1 counter on a creature we control whenever we draw a card, which will want to make a beeline to its level 3 to combine with Shauna's draw, which will provide our build with solid counter distribution to go along with the card advantage she provides, though its first two levels shouldn't be overlooked since they still provide solid card advantage and protection from overdrawing. It's then onto an additional life gain source as we move deeper into this slot with a Johnny's Welcome, which, whenever a creature ETBs under our control, gains us one life, providing us with another creature based source of life gain that works well with our large creature base and token creation. Then closing out this slot, we have the land ramp source Fonta Fertility, which lets us pay one a green and sack it to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, effectively making it a green flavored Wayfarer's Bobble to beef up our mana base while again proccing our land based life gain. Moving on to the CMC2 slot, we open with a trio of token creation sources, those being Griffin Airy, Hoofprints of the Stag, and Ominous Seas. Griffin Airy, on our end step if we gained 3 or more life that turn, creates a 2-2 flying griffin token, making it a very easy to trigger source of evasive bodies as we passively gain life. Hoofprints of the Stag and Ominous Seas both, whenever we draw a card, put a counter on themselves, the former generating hoofprint counters and letting us pay two a white and removing four of those counters from it to create a 4-4 flying elemental token at sorcery speed, and the latter accumulating four shadow counters instead and letting us remove eight of them from it to create an 8-8 kraken token, each taking advantage of the draw Shana provides to quickly load themselves up with counters that we can then use to grow our board states with either evasive or massive bodies respectively. 
We then close out this slot with Druid Class, another class which, at level 1, gains us 1 life whenever a land ETB is under our control, at level 2 which costs 2 and a green, lets us play an additional land per turn, and at level 3 which costs 4 and a green, turns target land we control into a creature with haste whose stats are equal to the number of lands we control, which is still considered a land which will be primarily running for the land-based life gain it provides, but the additional land drops and land payoff creature it creates being decent as well if we have the mana to spend. It's then on to the CMC3 slot and its two green entrants, Retreat to Kazandu and Trudge Garden. Retreat to Kazandu, whenever a land ETB is under our control, either lets us put a plus one plus one counter on target creature or gain two life, making it yet another source of land-based life gain that we can occasionally use to pump our creatures instead if we don't need to pad our life totals. Trudge Garden, whenever we gain life, lets us pay two to create a 4-4 Fungus Beast creature token with Trample, taking advantage of our multiple sources of life gain to trigger over and over again, allowing us to flood the board with 4-4 Trampling bodies so long as we have the mana to pump into it. The CMC4 slot then brings us its pair of white entrants, Angelic Accord and Cradle of Vitality. Angelic Accord, on each end step if we gain 4 or more life that turn, creates a 4-4 Angel token with flying, effectively making it another copy of Valkyrie Harbinger to get us even more decent sized evasive bodies on board on our turns, and occasionally on our opponent's turns as well. Cradle of Vitality, whenever we gain life, lets us pay 1 in a white to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature for each 1 life we gained in that instance, giving us a way to spend our spare mana to grow our creatures as we gain life, which works well to grow our commander and make her bigger and bigger as she continues to connect thanks to her life link. And finally, reaching the CMC5 slot and our last enchantment, we have Glorious Sunrise, which, at the beginning of combat on our turn, has us choose one of the following effects. All creatures we control gain plus one plus one and trample until end of turn. Target land can tap for triple green until end of turn. Draw a card if we control a creature of three plus power, or gain three life. All its modes being very usable by us, whether it be to empower our creatures to swing in with, netting us extra card advantage if we don't have access to our commander, getting us some extra mana to pump into Shauna's draw, or just serving as another source of life gain. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. The CMC1 slot brings us the only artifact we're running, Wayfarer's Bobble, which lets us pay two, tap it and sack it to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, edging out Soul Ring in this build, which would still make a good addition for the extra mana it provides to pump into our commander's draw, by more reliably fixing our colors while proccing our land focus life gain while it does so. That covers all our artifacts, and since we have no planeswalkers in this build, let's move straight to our land base. Starting off with our mana lands, we have Command Tower, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Exotic Orchard, which taps for any color an opponent's land would be able to produce, Seaside Citadel, which comes into play tapped and taps for any of our colors, Fortified Village, Port Town, and Vine Glimmer Snarl, all of which come into play tapped unless we reveal a basic land type of the mana they can produce and tap for one of two of our colors, Canopy Vista and Prairie Stream, which come into play tapped unless we control two plus basic lands and tap for one of two of our colors in addition to having the basic land types of the mana they can produce, Yavamaya Coast, which either taps for a colorless or a blue or green instead if we take a damage, and finally Broker's Hideout, Evolving Wilds, and Terramorphic Expanse, all of which we can sack to put a basic land from our deck into play tapped, the first doing so when it ETBs and gaining us a life, while the latter two can be tapped to do so. Then as our only utility land, we're running Sapseep Forest, which is considered a forest, comes into play tapped, taps for a green, and lets us pay a green and tap it to gain one life if we control two plus green permanents, making it an easy to meet form of repeatable life gain from our land slot. And lastly, we're running seven plains, seven islands, and nine forests as our basics to close out our land base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 38 creatures including the commander, 4 instants, 8 sorceries, 13 enchantments, 1 artifact, 0 planeswalkers, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 34 sources of life gain, 16 cards that care about life gain, 5 cards that care about draw, 13 sources of plus one plus one counters for themselves or others, and 8 sources of token generation. Giving us a huge amount of life gain to enable our commander's draw, plenty of payoffs for both when we gain life and draw cards off our commander's ability, most of which improve our board state by either loading up our creatures with counters or getting us extra bodies on board. For general deck stats, we have 15 ramp sources, 7 card draw sources, 8 targeted removal sources, and 2 board wipes, 
Our ramp being higher than normal, since we have plenty of payoffs for land-based ramp in addition to needing lots of mana to pump into Shanna's draw effect, while our draw and removal are slightly lower than average in this build, since we have easy access to draw from the command zone and the removal we do have access to in this build is more easily accessible thanks to that draw, leaving our wipes being the only category that falls within normal numbers. Looking at our mana curve, we have 15 1 drops, 19 2 drops, 12 3 drops, 7 4 drops, 6 5 drops, 3 6 drops, and 2 7 drops leaving us with an aggressive curve that aims to ramp hard early, then dropping multiple sources of passive life gain onto the board, followed up by our commander to turn that life gain into card advantage, letting us quickly draw through our deck for our payoffs until we drown our opponents in a sea of tokens and plus one plus one counter-laden creatures. Currently, this deck is valued at 65.16, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, a Johnny's Pride Mate, Celestial Unicorn, and Ageless Entity are all fine includes if we find ourselves wanting more creatures that grow as we gain life. Philidar Sovereign is another good alternate win con that works well with our life gain playstyle, and Rock's Faith Mender is a good way to double up on our life gain so long as he sticks around, making meeting the life gain thresholds on certain cards easier. For upgrades, Alhamaret's Archive doubles our life gain sources effectiveness as well as the draw Shana provides, Life Gift provides us with even more life gain as we and our opponents make our land drops, Auroch Champion is another Soul Sister effect to gain us even more life as creatures come into play, and Heliod Suncrowned is another superb payoff for our life gain that distributes counters and can grant lifelink to our creatures, which combines well with our evasive creatures and tokens. And finally, the Angel's Archangel of Thune and Resplendent Angel would also make excellent additions, both being able to gain us life thanks to their own built-in flying and lifelink, while also distributing even more plus one plus one counters and creating even more evasive tokens as we gain life. Though expect our funds to go down at an equal rate as our life totals go up if we want to add these two to our build. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Firstly, I'd like to take a moment to thank the channel subs again for helping the channel crack both the 7.4 and 7.5k subscriber milestones. Sincerely, thank you all for your continued support as this channel would be unable to grow without it. Then taking a look at the results of last week's poll, it looks like Ellis Elcor was able to redeem her previous loss and claim the top spot, so look forward to a life gain aristocrats build featuring her next week. Moving on to this week's poll, with Ellis coming out on top of last week's poll, I feel it's only fair to give some of the other second place entrants a shot at the first place spot. So this week's contenders will consist of the Undead Swamp Lich, Radadrabic of Urborg, Tetsuo Umezawa's second in command, Torwaku the Younger, and the nature-infused soul of a planeswalker, Soul of Wind Grace. Please cast your vote in the community tab, link in the description, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and what commanders you want to see from Dominaria United in future polls. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And speaking of which, I'd like to thank SaxCat63 for their generous donation. Thanks for the coffee, SaxCat63, and thank you for supporting the channel. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one, folks, and stay safe.